All right, so last time we left off, we actually were talking about deltoid. Um, but somebody asked a good, really good question about biceps injuries, right? Um, so thinking back to last time to kind of build a review in here, what, is, what are the two sites of origin of the bicep brachii muscle? What are, what are those two? Remember? Yep. Uh, okay, so what's the origin of the long head? All right. Crazy? You looked up at the wrong time. <laughs> All right. Yep. Yep. So the long head originates from the supraminoid tubercle. And then the short head from the coracoid process. Good. And I don't know your name. Luke. And then Megan? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. All right. So Luke and Megan. All right, um, all right, so those are the two sides of origin. What is the insertion for biceps? Break the eye. Does I remember? Yep. Radial tuberosity. Good, radial tuberosity or tuberosity of the radius. Very good. All right, so what are some actions of biceps? What's it do? Gavin, what do you think? Okay. Oh, you know what biceps does. Come on. You just do something. You're going to want to work your biceps. I'm getting ready to go to the beach next year. Never too early to start preparing. What should I do to work my biceps? Yeah. Uh, like curl. Yeah, curl. Okay, good. So what we did there was flexion at the humeral ulnar joint, right? So it's an elbow flexor. All right, what else does biceps do? Good. Flexion going on humeral, so it's a shoulder flexor. All right, and then one more thing. Okay. Supination, good. So flips your forearm over to where your palms are facing forward, good. So glenohumeral flexion, humeral ulnar flexion, and then supination makes your palm face forward, good. All right, so we talked about last time, in terms of biceps injuries, um, you can either get an injury to the distal biceps, which is the insertion there at the tuberosity of the radius, which is fairly common in strength sports. So I mentioned a video last time of a guy deadlifting, and I'll show you that. It'll let me click out of this. Well, that's what their repair looks like, and that's a picture I'll show you in a second. All right. So in strength sports, so in powerlifting and strongman, um, when they have to not use straps, typically you go with an alternating grip. So one hand's over, one hand's under. And by that I mean one hand is pronated, the other hand's supinated. And so what you're going to want to watch is his left arm. Watch the supinated grip, because again, biceps is a supinator and an elbow flexor. You don't have sound, but you don't really need the sound. So watch his left bicep. I like the surprise here. My favorite part about this. Wait a minute. <laughs> right? So if you, in case you missed it, because it's pretty quick, and that video is spectacular too. So again, watch the, there you go. So it yeah. pops off as soon as he goes to lift the bar off the ground, right? Because what he's doing, and you'll notice, and not to make you watch it again, but when he starts, you'll notice that his elbow is in flexion, right? So he's lifting several hundred pounds there. And so in doing that, it's pretty easy to overload biceps at its insertion there, the tuberosity of the radius. And so what you notice was biceps pops off of its insertion and then rolls up on itself a little bit. And so, like I said, that, that type of injury is fairly common in strength sports. So whether it's powerlifting, which you see it on the deadlift, or whether it is strongman kind of stuff, where they, they also do it on deadlift, like tire deadlifts and stuff, but also if they're doing like lifting stones where they have to simultaneously flex the elbow and flex the shoulder, that's a pretty common injury with that. Um, and you can see, so what that is, is a picture of how they repair your distal biceps. So for that um, deadlifter there, how they would fix that, basically they, they run a threading through the tendon or the muscular tendinous junction of that muscle. And they actually go through and they drill a hole. So this is your radius. So they drill a hole through the radius and then there's a little plug that they split there at the end. That's the anchor. And so that way it is securely anchored into your radius. So the bicep there is not going to pop back out of your radius. It's, it's in there good. Um, now, it's not to say you won't tear it like up here at the musculotendinous junction where those two meet, but it's not going to pop out of your radius again. So that's a pretty common tear. The other kind of biceps tear is a proximal biceps. So again, proximal is closer to the body. 
So your proximal bicep pairs, typically we're talking about a long head pair. Remember the long head originates from the supraglenoid tubercle, so the top of the glenoid. And so usually what you've got there is the, the shoulders in flexion, and it's then being forced into extension. And so when that happens, you know, bicep is going to be contracting, but lengthening. And so then it can pull away from its, its origin there at that supraglenoid tubercle. Same kind of thing tends to roll up on itself. And so the, the particular deformity that this guy has is called a Popeye deformity, which is a really dated reference now. But if you've ever seen Popeye, where his little, he's got his little uh, mountain biceps there. So that's what happens with a proximal rupture. Is again, it rolls up on itself. And so then that uh, long head which is on the more lateral aspect, rolls up on itself, so you have this really high-peaked bicep because of the belly pulling in uh, onto itself. So with that, um, depends on the population that we're talking about. So we're talking about young athletes or young healthy people like everybody in here. Uh, usually what they'll do, same kind of a procedure, they'll run a thread through it and then actually drill it or screw it back into the glenoid uh, to anchor it back down. But if you're talking about somebody who is older, so 60 and above, oftentimes they won't fix it um, because you've got other muscles that are shoulder flexors, you've got other muscles that are elbow flexors, and so they'll just leave it alone. Plus the short head usually stays attached. So you still have good enough function for activities of daily living. So brushing your teeth, combing your hair, those kinds of things. But if you're trying to do you know, lift weights or throw a baseball or those kinds of things, you obviously need both heads of biceps attached. So this is what that looks like. All right, uh, deltoid we left off with last time, so you should hopefully have this stuff on there. I'm mentioning deltoid again because what it does will be important when we talk about the rotator cuff. So what I want you to remember about deltoid for right now, as far as key things, is that remember deltoid is involved in pretty much anything we do at the glenohumeral joint. So every time you move your arm, deltoid's involved. It's a different part of deltoid depending upon what it is that you're going to do. So for example, the anterior aspect of deltoid is involved in glenohumeral flexion, so coming straight forward. This middle or lateral portion is involved in abduction, so coming straight out to the side. And then the posterior portion is involved in glenohumeral extension, so coming straight back. And then the anterior fibers are involved in internal rotation, taking your humerus or in the front of your humerus, rotating it toward the midline. Posterior fibers, external rotation. So the only thing we left out then was adduction. So Deltoid then is involved in everything other than adduction. So it does lots of stuff, right? So that'll be important in a second. All right, so new muscles. So now we're getting into the rotator cuff. So supraspinatus, the origin is the supraspinous fossa. So remember anything uh, supraspinous, we're referring to above the spine. And in this context, again, not your spine, not your vertebral column, but the spine of the scapula which is this obvious bony ridge here. So supraspinous means above this spine. So supraspinatus is above the spine of the scapula. So the reason you're that supraspinous fossa inserts on the greater tubercle of the humerus. And so from a, an osteokinematic standpoint, which again, big, obvious motions, flexion, extension, et cetera. From an osteokinematic standpoint, then supraspinatus is involved in abduction. Some texts will also say it's involved in flexion, but it is primarily involved in abduction, bringing your arm out to the side. Now that said, all four of the rotator cuff muscles are gonna be involved in stabilizing the glenohumeral joint. So remember that they act as dynamic stabilizers. They keep the humeral head aligned with the glenoid while we're moving. The supraspinatus is one of those. We'll see if the anatomy app cooperates today. So on the anatomy app, so this is with all of his muscles on him. And again, I'll stick to the right side. So what is this muscle that I'm mousing over right now? Everybody remember, hopefully. Yeah, your trapezius, good, so your traps. So we'll take his traps off, hide them. And so now, there we go. Now you can see his supraspinatus muscle. So supraspinatus then is deep to your trapezius. So you can't see it on somebody just looking at them because again, it's deep to traps. I'm actually going to take off deltoid here, I'll hide that as well, and so now you can see the origin or the belly here and then the insertion there on the most superior aspect of the greater tubercle. And um, I don't know how much you've played with the anatomy app because I just found this feature last night, but it's a super cool little feature. Um, so if you scroll over on this menu right here, um, so you know you've got cross sections that you'll never use, uh, motions which is helpful, 
but then there's an O and I one. So you click on that and then just pick one. So if we zoom out, oh, it's on deltoid, sorry, go back. I click on super spinatus because that's what we're talking about. Now scroll over to the little O and I. There it is. Okay. So we zoom out. So again, the origin is the supraspinous fossa, the red there. The insertion is that most superior aspect of the greater tubercle, so the purple there. So rather than doing it the way I had to learn it, which is this guy, I spent a lot of time with this diagram. Um, you can use that, and again, the skeletons in the lab are set up the same way with the reds and blues, but um, on the anatomy app, it sort of comes to life. So you can see the origin and the insertion there. So just something to be aware of, because I think that's a pretty handy little tool. All right. So that's supraspinatus. And then let's talk about the next one down. Oh, before I leave supra, just because we got time. So supraspinatus is the most commonly injured of the, of the four rotator cuff muscles. So almost always if somebody gets a rotator cuff repair, it's supraspinatus. And that the reason that one's injured, there's a couple things that can happen. Primarily a subacromial impingement. So remember that your acromion is the tip of the shoulder, the subacromial space is the space underneath it. So that's where we talk about either your scapula isn't moving correctly or you have maybe too much laxity, too much looseness in your shoulder capsule, too much weakness in the rest of your rotator cuff muscles, et cetera. But somehow supraspinatus is getting impinged. As we age, um, the tendons are less able to repair themselves, which is why you see like older players oftentimes in sports um, tear their Achilles tendon. Your, again, your tendons get less able to repair themselves with age. And so supraspinatus is no exception. Uh, blood supply goes down. The cells, the fibroblasts are less able to, to produce collagen and repair it. So you get this, these degenerative changes with age. But in addition to that, Underneath the acromion, you get bone spurs. And the name for those is osteophytes. And so you get these little projections from the bone so that every time you're abducting the arm, you'll get some catching of the supraspinatus muscle on those. And you can imagine that kind of digs into the muscle and tears it. So you get this combination of the osteophytes tearing it, poor posture, closing down the space, plus um, it's less able to repair itself and so then eventually it tears. The most common presentation of that is typically people in their 50s or 60s come into the orthopedist and they're like, I had shoulder pain for the last year, it's gotten progressively worse. Now I can't lift my arm overhead. Now I can't brush my teeth or comb my hair. And so again, because supraspinatus, what they've got then is a supraspinatus tear. Um, and so because supraspinatus is involved in abduction, so obviously you gotta abduct and externally rotate to comb your hair and a similar kind of thing whenever you're brushing your teeth. So they just can't do those things and that's usually what brings them into the doctor's office. And so what they'll do, same kind of thing we talked about with biceps, um, there's a couple different ways they can fix um, the supraspinatus muscle. Either they can kind of run some threading through here and screw it back into um, the greater tubercle, or they can actually just drill two holes in the greater tubercle and then run the threading the other direction, kind of through the muscle belly. But either way, the outcomes tend to be pretty good. Now they've regained their ability to have them. All of us. All right, infraspinatus, second most commonly injured of the rotator cuff muscles. So remember that infraspinatus deals with inferior to the spine. So again, inferior to the spine of the scapula, which is the bony ridge. So it originates in the infraspinous fossa, also inserts the greater tubercle of the humerus, inferior to the supraspinatus muscle. And it is an external rotator. And in case I hadn't already mentioned this, I'll also say lateral rotation. So I use external and lateral rotation interchangeably, it means the same thing. So it's an external or lateral rotator. Um, and again, it's, its insertion is inferior to supraspinatus. Um, in terms of finding it on the anatomy app, it's actually a superficial muscle. You can see it on people and you can feel it contract on yourself. Um, if you're bored or maybe done writing. If you find the spine of your scapula, go down just below it and then rotate your arm out. You'll feel contraction in the So that's your infraspinatus muscle. So again, a superficial muscle visible on most people. Um, in terms of injuries to this, sometimes it gets injured in throwing athletes, like because, so as an external rotator, so bringing you out here, it's responsible for slowing your arm down after you throw a ball or a javelin or serve tennis ball or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and so sometimes it can get overloaded because we really, we only have two primary external rotators, infraspinatus and teres minor, and again, deltoid is specific to that. So it's easy for those little muscles to get overloaded and to get strained. And so, 
Um, that's one of the ways empress spinase can get strained. It's pretty uncommon to injure it like acutely. Um, I read a couple case reports last night of, of uh, football players basically falling on their hand and getting their arm forced into internal rotation and tearing it. Um, the outcomes of that, if they get it fixed, um, same kind of thing, a threading and screw type of a procedure, the outcomes of that are pretty good. They can usually return to play without too much of a problem. And so on our muscle model here, so there's your infraspinatus. And again, if we leave traps on this guy, so I'll actually switch to his left side here. So you can see infraspinatus peeking out right there between traps and deltoid. So on most people's upper back, it's pretty obvious. And again, it becomes more obvious if you ask them to move, it'll pop up. All right, Terry's minor. So Terry's minor and infraspinatus are kind of partners. They do the same stuff. Um, so Terry's minor, you can see that it originates from the lateral border of the scapula. Uh, and I'll show you that origin on the, the netter picture here in a second. And then the insertion is also the greater tubercle of the humerus. So inferior to infraspinatus. So from top to bottom or superior to inferior goes supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, as far as their insertions on the greater tubercle. And then teres minor, as you can see, is also an external rotator with infraspinatus and an adductor. So one of the things that gets confusing a little bit is so there's two teres muscles. There's teres minor and teres major. They rotate the arm and Terry's minor is part of the rotator cuff and an external rotator. Terry's major is not part of the rotator cuff and it's an internal rotator. So that can get confusing. So just something to be aware of. So Terry's minor, rotator cuff muscle, basically a, an analog almost to infraspinatus. So if we go then to the app, slide him over. So this little guy here is his Terry's minor. So and if we isolate that, you can see, so it's a pretty little muscle, right? So fairly small, it's fairly small in the muscle model you'll see in lab tomorrow as well. And then if we, if I can figure out how to do the O and I, doesn't matter, we'll do it here. So in terms of the origin, so this is the origin site of Terry's minor. So there's kind of two spots, there's right here and then right here. And then you can see the insertion, the more, the most inferior of them um, there on the greater tubercle. All right. Then, oops, did I do, we skipped subscap. Or we talked about subscap last time, so just as a recap. <laughs> so subscap, um, so it should already be on your sheet, but um, since we split it over two days. Um, so subscapularis, subscapular fossa, lesser tubercle of the humerus, it's an internal rotator. So the four ro rotator cuff muscles then, subscapularis, it's on the anterior aspect, an internal rotator. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. So those are your four rotator cuff muscles and why they matter. They matter because of arthrokinematic motion. So remember that arthrokinematic motion are rolls, slides, and spins that happen inside of a joint. So there's small movements between the two bones that allow for the big osteokinematic motion. So here's where deltoid becomes important. Remember deltoid is involved in everything other than adduction at the glenoid. So if I do this, lift my arm out to the side, so abduction or flexion or extension, whatever, deltoid's involved in all of them. Well, because of deltoid's line of pull, so remember it originates out here in the lateral third of the clavicle, the acromion, and then kind of that lateral third of the spine of the scapula. Because of deltoid's line of pull, where it inserts in the deltoid tuberosity, every time that muscle contracts, it's gonna slide your humerus up. So whenever I go to move my arm, the first thing that happens is actually your humerus slides up a little bit. Not something that y'all can observe when I move around, but it's a, it's a pretty minute little slide. When that happens, then that closes down that subacromial space. And so then you would tend to impinge upon supraspinatus, the bicep, the long head of bicep tendon, and that subacromial bursa. But the job of the rotator cuff is to prevent that superior slide, or at the very least to minimize it. So actually, before deltoid contracts, your rotator cuff muscles contract. So all four of the ones we just talked about. And so by them contracting, what they do is they hug the humeral head against the glenoid. So rather than allow for that superior slide that deltoid would otherwise tend to cause, they actually change the motion a little bit and cause it to be a roll toward the glenoid and then an inferior slide. 
So the job of the rotator cuff then, a couple jobs. Again, dynamic stabilizers. They keep the humerus or the humeral head and the glenoid in line with each other, but also they keep that subacromial space open. So one of the things that can lead to subacromial impingement and bicep injury is if your rotator cuff is weak or fatigued. So if you're a throwing athlete and you're just out there throwing, you know, 125 pitches or something like that, your rotator cuff is going to get fatigued. So now you're getting extra movement at the glenohumeral joint. You're getting more sliding upwards than you want, and so then you tend to get impingement and damage to some of those underlying some of the structures in that subacromial space. So the job of the rotator cuff then is to keep that space open. So they can they convert what would be a superior slide of the humerus into a roll toward the glenoid and then an inch. So that's their job. All right, we've got a couple more muscles. So now I got latissimus dorsi. Over here left. Um, so latissimus dorsi, pretty big muscle, as you can see there. And so with the big muscle, it has a really uh, broad origin. So it has an origin at the inferior angle of the scapula. But a fun fact I learned last night is that. Um, not all of us have an origin there at that inferior angle of the scapula. In fact, only about half of us do. So um, I think the anatomy app lists that. I'm not sure about that, but definitely the netter app lists that as an origin. But again, all of us are a little bit different, so only about half of us have that first origin there at the inferior angle of the scapula. I'll tell you why that matters. Um, you can also see it originates from the ninth through the twelfth ribs, the spinous processes of the lower half of the thoracic region. Also from the thoracolumbar fascia. What in the world is that? So your thorax again, your chest, lumbar, your low back. So the thoracolumbar fascia is all of this white stuff that you see taking up the low back here on our anatomy model. And so the job of the thoracolumbar fascia, you don't have to know this, but it's relevant. Um, so the job of the thoracolumbar fascia, or one of the jobs, is to transfer force from one side of the lower body to the contralateral to the other side upper body. So for example, you do this without thinking about it, but when you walk, so I'll push off with my right leg, so I'll extend my right hip, I'll push back. When we walk then, what we do is we swing our left arm, right, to counterbalance that. And so what that thoracolumbar fascia does then is it transfers force from the right hip through that fascia to the lats. And then the lats contract, and I swing my other side arm back. So I swing my other glenohumeral joint in this direction. So lats are actually pretty important during normal gait, gait meaning walking. Same thing during running. Um, another thing about lats, because they hook into the thoracolumbar fascia, they're also a low back, a lumbar stabilizer. And so sometimes when people have like a really tight lat, um, just from doing lots of pulls and those kinds of things, um, or just from posture, you know, people don't reach overhead a lot in terms of their activities of daily living. And so your lats can get stiff or short. And so if that's the case, then when you go to reach overhead, you're one, going to be limited, but two, if we really kind of force them to reach overhead, they may report low back pain. And so what has happened there a lot of the time is that lats then kind of pulls their low back forward and compresses it. And so it hyperextends, for lack of a better term, their lumbar spine. And so then that can cause pain. So lats can also be involved in low back pain because of that origin there along the thoracolumbar fascia. And then the iliac crest, that's that ridge of your hip on either side, so up here. Um, if you go into your abdomen and push down that, that obvious ridge, that's your iliac crest. And then the insertion of the lats is along that intertubercular groove on the medial aspect. So essentially, there's three muscles that insert along that intertubercular groove. There's pec major, which is on the lateral aspect, then latissimus dorsi, and then teres major. So lateral to medial, pec major, lats, teres major. So, and on the app, back out. Okay. So, obviously there's your lats. One of the things I want to point out though, because lats has an interesting insertion and you can see that it kind of spirals around. I got to hide some stuff. We'll hide pecs, we'll hide biceps, and we'll hide coracobrachialis. So, so there's your lat insertion there. So you can see how it kind of spirals around teres major. So the muscle right above it, right here, is teres major. And again, inserts an intertubercular groove. An important thing to know as well is that if a muscle inserts on that medial aspect of the humerus, it's going to be an internal injury. So lats is no exception. So lats are 
extrinsic adductors and internal rotators, as opposed to infraspinatus and teres minor actually wrap around the back side and insert on the greater tubercle. So both of those two are external rotators. All right. So, and then one more thing with lat. So you can see that origin there on the inferior angle. So again, only about half of us have that. Um, if you do have that, good news is you're less likely to dislocate your shoulder. Um, people that have that origin there at that uh, inferior angle, what ends up happening is they have a higher uh, origin of their lats. So you can see the, or sorry, higher insertion of lats. So you can see the insertion here. People that have that origin on the inferior angle of the scapula tend to have a little bit higher or a little more proximal insertion of their latissimus. And so what that means is when the arm is in abduction, then lats kind of overlap the subscap. And so then you've got two muscles essentially on that anterior aspect of your glenohumeral joint. So it helps stabilize it because glenohumeral dislocations uh, primarily occur from a combination of abduction, external rotation. So the higher up that lat is, the better it is for stabilizing the shoulder. The downside, of course, is that the closer the lat is to the axis of rotation, the less turning force is able to produce. So you're probably not as good at pull-ups, but you got a more stable shoulder. So, you know, trade off there. I thought that was super fascinating, and I was telling my wife that last night as I was reading in a clinical anatomy, anatomy journal, and she was like, nobody's going to care. Like, that's the most boring thing. I was like, whatever. I think it's cool. Yeah. Um, probably not, um, because that's also then going to limit your external rotation. And so if you're a really high level, you know, MLB pitcher kind of a guy or, you know, Drew Brees, I would imagine their, um, their insertion is probably a little bit lower. So their shoulder is a little bit less stable, but that gives them more external rotation and then gives them more torque, more turning power whenever they go to throw the ball. So yeah, good observation. If you're an elite throwing athlete, that's a really good question. It would be interesting to know if you looked at them. The relative height of their lat insertion, because I bet it makes a difference. Yeah, good question. Yep. The only way I know of is cadaver model. I guess you could probably do it via MRI, maybe, but I don't know that. I don't know how you'd actually do that investigation. But the one I'm referencing is all cadavers, so yeah. Um, all right, so there's lats. And then, oh, I was, the other thing I was going to show you, sorry, I forgot. Because, you know, again, that's a really big origin that kind of makes uh, relatively little sense just in terms of how much of it there is. So I think this is where the origin insertion thing is pretty helpful. If we zoom out. So there's obviously the insertion. And if I spin them around, so you can see the origin there along the spines of those inferior thoraco or yeah, thoraco vertebrae. Um, thoraco lumbar fascia isn't on there, but you can see the origin along the iliac crest and then also the origin along the bottom for ribs as well. All right, to your left, teres major. So teres major originates from um, kind of a combination of that inferior angle of the scapula and also to some extent the lateral border. Um, so this should be the wording that's in the anatomy act, the dorsal surface of the inferior angle of the scapula. So obviously the dorsal is the posterior. Uh, surface. So posterior source, surface of the inferior angle of the scapula. And again, it's going to insert along that intertubercular groove. It's the most medial of the three that insert along there. And for actions, at the glenohumeral joint, it does the same three things that the lats do. So it's an adductor, an extensor, and an internal rotator. So when you're doing pull-ups or wide grip pull-downs or any of that kind of stuff, when you're lifting yourself up, you're working both lats and teres major because they effectively do Obviously, teres major has no impact on the lumbar spine, but at the glenohumeral joint, the two muscles do the same things. Um, if they're injured, oftentimes they're injured together. Some people actually have the same tendon of insertion. Actually, the two muscles fuse and have the same uh, area of insertion. Not on many people, but some people have that fusion. Um, so. I was reading an article recently about an increase in the number of lat strains in baseball pitchers, and apparently it's increased pretty dramatically over the last 15 years. But I didn't see any good theories as to why that is. But lat strength is important, as we talked about for your throwing athletes, because it's going to be that internal rotator of the shoulder and help you produce that force um, for to initiate throwing motion. And then lastly, the triceps. The triceps obviously means three heads. 
So there's a long head, a lateral head, and a medial head. Um, and just to make your life confusing, at least this was confusing for me when I first learned it, so you can't really see the medial head, because it would make sense, thinking about it, like, okay, medial is close to the midline, so this is the medial head, and this is the lateral head. That's not how it works. So this one that's highlighted is actually the long head. So the long head originates from the infraglenoid tubercle. This one is long. And so if you have that, somebody has a well-developed tricep or they have kind of an upside down horseshoe shape, it is the medial aspect of that horseshoe. Then the lateral head is over here. So it's going to originate on that posterior lateral humerus. And then the medial head is actually deep to those two. So they're going to pull those two off to be able to see the medial head. So it's that posterior medial aspect of the humerus. The medial head has a really broad origin. Um, and I'll show you how to find that on the, the anatomy out here in a second. All three of them insert into the olecranon process. What is the olecranon? Um, it is that tip of your elbow. So whenever you poke your elbow out and there's that pretty obvious bony knob there, that is your olecranon. So all three heads of the triceps insert there. So all three heads of the triceps then act together as your primary elbow extensor, so extension at the humeral ulnar joint. And then the long head is the only one that crosses the shoulder, and so the long head is also a glenohumeral or shoulder extensor. Yep. Yeah, good question. So typically what's, what's referred to as quote-unquote tennis elbow is a lateral epicondylitis. So anytime you've got an itis, that's an inflammation. And so your lateral epicondyle is that knob on the lateral aspect of your elbow there. And so your wrist extensor muscles, the muscles that cause you to pick up your wrist like this, or when you fall and catch yourself on outstretched hand, that's wrist extension. So the wrist extensors originate there. So tennis, traditional tennis elbow is basically um, usually people who are weekend warriors, quote unquote, um, who like do do like me, do nothing during the week, and they go out and do a bunch on the weekend. Um, and so with that, if they go and do a bunch of like one-handed backhand, so repetitive, really forceful wrist extension, you can get an inflammation of those extensors there at their origin. So it's not usually a tricep issue so much as a, a wrist extensor issue. But really good question. Um, tricep in injuries typically, at least the ones I'm aware of in a sporting concept context, are more like uh, the elbow is extended and then forced into flexion. So like Ray Lewis a few years ago before he retired, missed some time with a tricep tear. And basically what happened was, um, and in giving this explanation, I assume you're all football fans. I'm sure you're not. But anyway, uh, Ray Lewis, middle linebacker, some, uh, let's say an offensive lineman was coming at him. And so he went to take on the block. So his arms are out here and the offensive lineman, you know, obviously slammed into him. So it forced his elbows from extension where triceps is contracting into flexion. So it overloaded the triceps and then he had a, a minor tricep tear. And he missed a few weeks with that. Um, so that's a fairly common, at least in a football kind of an injury, or if you catch yourself, that's another way to say it, I guess. Yep. Yeah, so um, certain tissues are better at repairing themselves than, other, than others. Muscles are actually pretty good, at least the muscle bellies um, are pretty good at repairing themselves, but it's just not quite the same as the original tissue. Kind of like a scar, you know, if you cut yourself and you get a scar, like that still closes it and it still moves around a little bit, but it doesn't quite move like the original skin does. And so, yeah, it's just, it doesn't function quite the same as it did before the injury. Unfortunately, right, because we, we all want to believe we can rehab and like be back to 100%. And first, a lot of injuries you can or be really close, um, but it's still not quite the same. Um, so on triceps, again, that last thing I wanted to show you was, okay, all right. So, zoom out a little bit on this guy. All right, so there's triceps. Again, so this is the, the long head that originates there on the scapula. This is the lateral head. So the only two you can see when you're doing tricep extensions or, or um, stick with that. The only two you can see are the long head and the lateral head. And then the medial head, to get to it, we have to kind of rotate in. And this is it right here, that tiny little thing there. Now, it's, it's big, but it's a deeper structure. And the anatomy app won't let you pull off individual heads. So if I go to pull that off, it'll take off the entire tricep. So to make that a little more clear, so all of this is the origin of that medial head. So it's a big area of the muscle. It's just deeper if you can't. All right, 
So those are the last of the muscles. So since we got about 10 ish minutes left, a little more than that, um, let's play a little game of Simon Says. Simon Says Review Game. All right. So Simon Says, show me glenohumeral flexion. Okay, good. David got it. Okay, good. Everybody's pretty much there at this point. So glenohumeral flexion. So again, always start in anatomical position, palms and supination, and then go straight forward. So that's glenohumeral flexion. All right, very good. Name for me three agonists. And remember an agonist, and so what I'm trying to do here is to get you used to this terminology. An agonist is a prime mover. So what are three muscles that you just activated to do that? Good, biceps, brachii, pec major. Here's a good one if you don't know anything for the shoulder. Guess deltoid. So anterior aspect of deltoid. All right, so we got pec major, biceps, anterior aspect of deltoid, and then coracal brachialis. Don't forget about that little guy. Luke? So lat is not. Um, what I try to do for simplicity's sake is just always act like we're in anatomical position. So right here, lat's going to lengthen. So it wouldn't be one. Yep. Good question. So pec major, lats. I mean, sorry, sorry. peg major, <laughs> oops, uh, corica brachialis, anterior delts, and biceps. All right, now name three antagonists. Luke? Lats, good, yep, so antagonist, remember, does the opposite, so lats, because they're an extensor, would be an antagonist. Posterior Good, posterior delt, because that's also an extensor, and then triceps, would, as long as it's long head, yep, so long head of triceps, good. Uh, what else can we think of? What does the same three things as lats? Carries major, good, yep. So those are our antagonists. Uh, plane and axis of glenohumeral flexion. What plane? I know David knows it, I think. David, what is it? Sagittal plane, very good, and then axis? X, good, X or bilateral, bilateral, same thing. Yep, so X or bilateral, very good. All right, and then how many degrees of freedom do we have in the glenohumeral joint? Three, good, nobody threw out 180, all right. And then show me scapulothoracic elevation. Okay, good, yep. So that's the shrugging motion, so just the I don't know. All right, give me two agonists for scapulothoracic elevation. What two muscles did I just activate to do that? Okay, which section? Yeah, so one and two, the, the more superior ones, right? So sections one and two of the traps, very good. What else is the scapular elevator? Might even have elevator in the name. Yeah, elevator scapulae, good. So elevator scapulae and trap sections one and two. Give me two antagonists for scapular elevation. So what are two muscles that do the opposite of scapular elevation? No takers. Pec minor is one. So what I'm really asking you here are depressors, right? And so scapular depressors, pec minor is one. And then uh, what's another scapular depressor? Subclavius would be another one. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of depressors. So subclavius, pec minor. All right, show me scapular thoracic protraction. Get that bad posture on, right? Slide those scapulas anteriorly. All right. Two agonists. Yep, also pec minor. Good. So remember, mu muscles do multiple things. So pec minor is one. And then what's the muscle that looks like a serrated knife? Good, serratus anterior. Three antagonists. So now we're, we're looking for retractors. So that's the opposite of project. Rhomboid major and minor. So there's two of them. What else we got? Yep, which sections? We call four a retractor? Definitely three. I think we did four, yeah. And two, uh, two as well, right? Did we say two, did? yeah, okay. So two, three, four, good. So traps, two, three, four, rhomboid major, rhomboid minor, 
Excellent. Show me glenohumeral external rotation. Yeah. So rotate the front of your humerus away from the midline. Good. Two agonists. Rotate your cuff muscles. Megan, what do you think? Oh, Chris, I got it. Maybe. Terry's minor will work. And then infraspinatus. Very good. So Terry's minor, infraspinatus are two primary external rotators and posterior delt. Four antagonists. So lots of internal rotators. Not so many externals. Give me four internals. Good. Anterior delt. Not that one, that one's primarily an AB ductor. Good guess though. Pec major, yep, so pec major, anterior delt. One more rotator cuff muscle, the only one we haven't named recently. Subscapularis. And then what was the big one that looks like you have wings if it's well developed? Your lats, good. So latissimus dorsi, teres major, pec major, anterior delt, subscapularis. So a lot of big, powerful muscles are internal rotators. That's why you can really crank it into internal rotation and throw a ball really hard. Not so much as far as external rotators, it's fairly weak in that. And if you're bored sometime in the weight room, if you use the little weight stack machine, just see how much you can do on external rotations, probably like 20 pounds. And then internal rotation, you can do, you know, very easy. So that's why. All right, show me scapulothoracic upward rotation. Okay, yeah, good guys. All right, so thoracic upward rotation. Remember, we're looking at the inferior angle of the scapula. It has to rotate up and out. So you can do that along with glenohumeral abduction. So just be aware that scapulothoracic upward rotation doesn't require you to move my arm, your arm, because that's right now I'm doing it without moving my arm. But normally we don't do that. We normally do that coupled with abduction in the glenohumeral side. So good. All right. So normal stick. Two agonists. What are two upward rotators? Uh, not in this case, but good guess. So what's going to rotate my scapula? Good. Traps, which sections? Two and four in this case. So traps two and four. Remember they work together. So traps two and four. And then what else? The ninth one. Yeah, serratus anterior. So I say that. So serratus anterior, if you look at it on the anatomy guy, you'll see it kind of it's serrated. It looks like a knife, right? Uh, like a steak knife. And so that's where the name comes from. It looks like a serrated blade. So serratus anterior, traps two and four. Four antagonists. So what are four downward rotators? This has become more of a beat down than I expected it to be. Uh, <laughs> I think this is the last time it's this. So there's a couple of other different categories. So Bryce, not Bryce, no, not Bryce. You are Preston. Preston. All right. So Preston, any any guesses on downward rotators? And there are muscles we've mentioned all of them already. One of them sits deep to pec major, and sounds very similar. Peck minor, all right, so peck minor is one, yep. Rhomboid minor, okay, and? Yeah, there's a token, all right, so those two go together. So rhomboid major, rhomboid minor, peck minor, and then what's my last downward rotator? Levator scapulae, good, yep, so that'll work. All right, doing pretty good. So other stuff, what are three muscles that insert the greater tubercle of the humerus? Ooh, good, good guess. Deltoid's a deltoid tuberosity, though. Yep. Good. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. So again, three of those four rotator cuff muscles. What muscle originates at the supraglenoid tubercle? The softball at this point. Biceps brachii, long head. Good. Two muscles that originate the coracoid process. Yep, coracobrachialis and... The other biceps head, so biceps short head. Two muscles that insert the medial border of the scapula. Megan? 
The two you just said, that's why I called you. Oh, okay. So rhomboid yep. And minor. and minor. Good. Yep. So rhomboid major, rhomboid minor are those two. All right. And then the last slide, four more, and then we're done, I promise. All right. So name one muscle that inserts at the superior angle of the scapula. Carissa? There you go. Levator scapulae. Very good. Actions, elevation, downward rotation. We already covered that. All right. Uh, one muscle that inserts at the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Yep. Subscapularis. Very good. And then actions for subscap. Internal rotation. Yep. Good. So that's its primary action is internal rotation. All right. Oh, wait. One more. So what are the three muscles that insert along the intertubercular groove of the humerus? And I might have said them at least three times today. Yep. A little too close answers. So you got two right. So the answer to that one, pec major, latissimus dorsi, and then teres major. So I'm going to try to always lay those out lateral to medial. So in the same basic order. All right. Pretty good job. So that's the end of the shoulder stuff. Tomorrow in lab, what we're going to do is find the muscles that we can on the plastic arms. And then I'll also have the skeletons out for you. And so we'll find the origin of insertions on the skeletons. Um, I have the answer keys to those, so it's not, not, not terrible. But it would be helpful if you had, I mean, you all have your phones, but if you had access to this PDF, because that's going to give you most of the answers to the origin of insertion stuff. So just be, have that handy for tomorrow. And then on Friday, we'll start with muscles. So, I mean, yeah, we'll actually talk about muscle tissue. Not we've been covering muscles, but we'll actually talk about muscle tissue starting on Friday. So we'll see you all then. So have a good day.